So the topic tonight is collaboration with God and others to bring cultural change. And uh, when I was asked to speak on this, I was very confused, and I didn't think I had much to say on it. Um, but uh, that's changed now. <laughs> and uh, I've got, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't got many nice slides, and I forgot to do a title slide, so it looks like the title of my talk is Culture Makes Me Sad. Uh, but that's not actually the title. It's a bit more positive than that. It's collaborating with God and others to bring cultural change. And it's the last in the series. And my, what a series it's been. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed the things we've done on this, on this term with all the things we've been going through. And I'm going to mention probably most of the talks that have already gone before. But um, culture is something that can make me sad. And those of you who know me might think it's because I'm talking about my dress sense or something like that, but it's not that kind of culture. It's what happens when I go on the bus and when I hear people talking to each other and when I go down the shops downtown and, and I just sense the emptiness and destructiveness of the way we treat each other and the way we talk to each other and, and what our society, what our culture has got to offer, I find it's really rather sad. And um, I have to be careful not to get all negative and depressed about it. But I think our culture really ultimately is empty and it's, it's lacking God, it's lacking life. And I don't like the norms in our nation. I don't like the things that are normal. You know, and, and so many of the normal things in our culture, like the normal way we behave as a group, the normal way we do life, a lot of those things are really, really sad. And we don't notice them even. We don't notice what we believe, what our beliefs and actions are. So, you know, one of the things that keeps cropping up, I keep coming across, is the attitude of men towards women. And, you know, there is just so much really horrible stuff about the way men talk to women and treat women and objectify women. And it's throughout our culture. And it's really, really bad and horrible. And yet it's kind of normal. And I'm, I'm often very embarrassed to be a man because of the way women get spoken about by men. And that, for me, that's one of the examples. I'm not going to list them all, otherwise we'll just start crying, I think, at the beginning of the talk. Um, but, you know, I mean, another one that um, Sarah talked about a couple of weeks ago is the way we treat God's wonderful creation. We don't think two hoots about spoiling what God's made. You know, our whole way of life is not sustainable. It can't go on. And we don't even notice most of the time. And Sarah was very brave in actually talking about something which we don't like to talk about about um, climate change and things like that. So that gave us a lot to think about. So anyway, right, what's going on? Well, a couple of weeks ago, Emma gave a really good description of culture from a chap called John Tyson, saying it's like there's a group of people centered around something in the middle that they worship and honor. There's this one thing that the group sort of focuses on, and then the things that we do, our, our way of life, our schools, our families, they all end up worshiping and honoring that which is in the middle. And so what's in the middle of our national culture? What's in the middle of our culture? Um, yeah, let's have another slide then, please, Sam. Um, basically, I think there's two kinds of culture. There's either culture focused on God or culture not focused on God. And, um, you know, we all know that way back in the beginning, Adam and Eve made a really bad decision, which ended up giving over our culture to the enemy, to Satan. And, um, you know, the good news, the fantastic news, is that our Father has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of Satan, which is, a, is one of the ways that Colossians 1 verse 13 gets translated. God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. And um, Jesus in John chapter 10 says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but he's come so we can have life, more and better life than we ever imagined. And so these two cultures, I would like to typify as the steal, kill, and destroy culture of the enemy, or the more and better life than we ever imagined culture of the kingdom of God. And I know which one I prefer. And uh, this, is, this gives me such hope, because... Jesus isn't looking for people just to kind of follow him to be dutiful and sad and, and, you know, stoic. He's looking for people who want more and better life than they ever dreamed of. You know, and in our culture, everyone's dreaming. They're dreaming of winning the lottery. They're dreaming of getting the perfect partner. 
They dream of all sorts of things. And Jesus said he's come so that we can have more and better life than we ever dreamed of. So that's the culture of Jesus that we're, we're talking about and looking for. And um, the way you get into this is, as Jesus says, we've got to follow him. We've got to be his disciples. And the term disciple, you know, it's not strong in our culture, the meaning of that. But in Jesus' day, there weren't many people who could actually be disciples. Um, you, had to be, you had to know the Jewish Bible like off by heart really well. And, and then if you were sort of that good, you could then go on and you could approach a rabbi, a teacher, and, and follow them and be their disciple. And the point was you wanted to look like them, you wanted to think like them, you wanted to be wherever they were, and they say like this, this proverb thing about let the dust of your rabbi's feet be on you because you've been following them so closely. Um, and so Jesus has given us this picture of following him where you know, our aspiration is to be like him, to look like him, to smell like him, to think like him, to eat like him. You know, it's that kind of deep thing. And the reason I'm mentioning disciples is because that's what Jesus said, you know, follow me, be my disciple. And he actually said something really tough on this. He said we can't be his disciples unless we take up our cross and follow him. So I'm thinking about this. I've always found this a bit strange. Take up your cross. What does that relate to in our culture? Well, I'm not quite sure, but let me explain Jesus' culture, if, you're not, if you didn't know this. At Jesus' time, it was the Romans in charge, and if they wanted to execute someone, they crucified them. And they would often make them carry their cross from the place of the trial to the place of execution. So Jesus is picking up on something pretty graphic here. He's saying, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to progress towards your execution. Now, that wasn't exactly what he meant, but he meant you've got to embrace your death. You've got to die to become a disciple. And um, this all sounds a bit weird if you don't know where it's going. But we know that Jesus said, if you die to the old life, you can live to him. And there's a lovely bit that Paul the Apostle writes. He says, I always carry around in my body the death of Jesus so the life of Jesus can be revealed. You know, all that old rubbish has got to come to an end. That's what this is about. And, and actually, all of us need to make that decision. We need to realize um, how, how it happens. So like Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow my footsteps, they must give up all right to themselves, carry their cross every day, and keep close behind me. That's Luke 9.23 from the J.B. Phillips translation. So it does sound a bit morbid and sad, but actually it's just what Jesus says, and it's the only way to get this more and better life than we ever dreamed of. So I just, you know, in my preparation, I just felt that's something to be really clear about how we get out of the culture of the world and into God's culture. And I think that slide summarizes um, these two cultures. So we can li we live in our own way, or we can be dead to our own way. We can be in the culture of the fall, you know, what Adam and Eve did wrong, and all the consequences of that, or we can be in the culture of God's kingdom. We can be living without God or with God. Satan can be in charge, or God can be in charge. And it's steal, kill, and destroy, or more and better life than we ever imagined. Right. So that's the kind of cultural change we want to bring, the kind of cultural change we need to see. And how did Jesus go about it? Um, and, and how do you change someone's culture? It's very difficult. You hear about battle for hearts and minds and things like this. You can't persuade someone to change their culture, I don't think. You can't have an intellectual discussion and say, you need to change your culture. Because it's really getting at our identity and who we are. And culture is very un... Uh, we don't speak it out. We don't know it. We don't know what's going on. Um, but what... Um, what I think changing culture is about is about experiencing something new. It's about an emotional thing. You know, something you feel it, you experience it. And when I was 16, I worked on a farm, which I think has got a lot to answer for. I work on a farm again now. Um, every Saturday I went on the farm with a friend of mine. And uh, we, we were just immersed in God's creation. We were working in, on the farmhouse garden most of the time. And one day he was just standing there holding a leaf and staring at it. And I, I said, you're right, Richard, what's going on? It's another Richard. And he said, there must be a God. And he just looked at the intricacies of this leaf, and he just felt like there must be a God. 
Now, I could have been trying to explain to him about the existence of God and that here we were out in God's creation and, you know, you see that leaf, God created that. Didn't, it wasn't intellectual, it was emotional, it was a feeling, it was an experience. And I think, you know, to be right about this, people will change their culture when they feel something different, when they experience something different. And I think that's what God is getting us to do. To, you know, one of the things God said about City Life coming into this building was that families come to town. You know, and that's about feeling part of something. It's about experiencing that. Um, so Jesus, uh, there's other things we can say as well, actually, about... Okay, moving on. Let's not go too long. I know it's four weeks till you get another talk, but I don't want to be four times longer than normal. Um, right, so the thing that Jesus did, he got in trouble with everyone because he was always crossing over the cultural norms of his time. He brought a totally different culture, didn't he? And he was getting in trouble for who he hung out with and how he, how he did life. And the thing that I want to focus on here, which probably is time for the next slide, is, is the open table of Jesus. He didn't have any entry requirements to be with him. Everybody was welcome. Everybody could be with him. And this is, you know, this is my first sort of gift to you, really, is to recognize the open tables that we're involved in and that we are making together as a church. Now, this lovely community cafe we do, the living room cafe, it's, it's just a kind of open table. We don't have someone at the door saying, now, you can't come in here unless you're born again. You can't come in here if you're living with someone. You can't come in here if you're rude to your kids this morning. Nothing like that. It's come in, come in, be part of, experience the goodness of God. So the open table is what Jesus had. And people were changed at his open table. Like, you know the one about the tax collector who Jesus said, I'm coming to your house for tea. And he sat with him and he was there. And he didn't have a discussion with him about corruption and extortion and things like that. He just went to his house for tea. And then the bloke says, Jesus, I'm going to give back money four times over to everybody I've extorted it from. And that was cultural change. And it was through the experience of being in the presence of Jesus. And that's what we're after. We're after an open table where people sense, experience, feel the presence of Jesus. So if we could just get Jesus to come along to our cafe and come along to our church, we'd be fine. Oh no, Jesus has gone back to heaven, hasn't he? Yes, um, I'm going to share one of my most favorite verses in the Bible now. It's Ephesians 2. 19, you belong now to the household of God. And in Jesus, each separate piece of the building, properly fitted to its neighbor, grows together into a temple consecrated to God. You are all part of this building in which God himself lives by his spirit. All right, God is present on the earth today because we are joined together to become a building spiritually that he dwells in. I think it's amazing. He is here with us tonight. He's here in the things we do during the week because we are being joined together spiritually. We are a temple that God dwells in. It's what Jesus does now. He doesn't, you know, he's not limited to one space on the earth, one moment. He's wherever we are, he is present among us. And this is why we come together and worship. This is why we pray together. This is why we have connect groups. This is why we do stuff together, because God is joining us together and is living amongst us. This is the experience of God that people can have. Oh, it's wonderful. Um, and I really, I really want to commend Emma's talk from a couple of weeks ago, because she was talking about how we need to spend time with God in his presence. We were meant to be face-to-face -face with God. She was talking about face-to-face. We're meant, you know, that's how he made us. So we need to make sure we're getting that time in our lives, in our routines, that we're face to face, we're in his presence. Because then we're carrying that presence out and people are experiencing God's presence and getting changed. So that's a good one to look up and uh, listen to or read again. And uh, I was just reminded, I think I said this last time I talked, but I'm going to say it again. Um, we've got our wonderful sacred space a place, a room dedicated to, for no other reason than to be with God, to be in his presence. Perfect, fantastic. And I was in there sometime last year, and I was reading the dedication on the wall of that place, and it says to God, you know, we've set this apart for no other reason than to meet with you. And I just felt him whisper in my heart, guess what? 
I've set it apart for no other reason than to meet with you. <laughs> so there's this massive promise over that space. If you want to meet with God, book some time in there. I don't know why it's more special there than your place you pray at home or whatever, but maybe it isn't more special. Maybe, it's, you know, God's got other places and times in your life that he's assigned, but there's a promise over that. And I know the more I go there, the more he's transforming me. And that's what we need, isn't it? Transformation. So anyway, I've just dropped that one in. Right, let's have another slide then. So I think what we've done so far... Oh, yeah, next slide then, please, Egbe. Um, I've been talking about us being the people of presence. That's what I was saying there. After the open table, I did the people of presence. You know, the open table still works. Jesus is in heaven, but we are the temple he dwells in, open table, with him, him, him present. And then the next slide, I think, is going to just summarize the three points so far. Yeah. So the culture we're talking about is the steal, kill, and destroy culture, or the more and better life. Um, disciples and crosses, you know, we just, we've got to get this one. If we're still holding on to our own agenda or our looking after ourselves, we need to just go the whole hog. And, and just die to our own agenda and die to holding on to our own things and trust Jesus because then we have this more and better life and the open table and the people of presence. Right, so that's what I think in a nutshell is, is about collaborating with God for cultural change. And uh, when I was preparing, there were two particular passages in the Bible which, which I just felt were, were pertinent for us at the moment as a church and I had to mention. So, next slide then, please. The, the first one is Revelation, and uh, I, just, I was in the sacred space a few weeks ago, and I just felt God say, read, Jesus, Jesus said, read my letters, read my letters. If you think about it, the letters at the beginning of the book of Revelation are what Jesus has said since he's gone back to heaven. You know, we've got what he said when he was still here in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but these are what he said since he's gone back to heaven. And they were specific to seven different churches. And I just, I read them, and uh, I saw a little pattern, and I'm not that clever, you know. I think anybody else reading them would see this pattern because it's really obvious. Um, there's, in each letter, there is a bit of correction where Jesus says, you know, you're doing, you're doing well, but there's this, and I'd like you to change this. I'd like you to do something different here. And, and he actually says there's consequences if you don't which I was a little bit uncomfortable about. Jesus saying, you know, if you don't do this, I'm, anyway, yeah, consequences. There was also, in everyone, there was, to those who overcome, or to those who conquer, there is a reward. There was an encouragement to overcome in every single letter, which I find a little bit daunting as well, you know, going to have to overcome, going to have to conquer. And there was this phrase in every single one, those who have an ear, let them hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And I think those three points I'm just going to unpack a little bit now. I feel like they're important for us. Um, so this thing, correction and consequences, is just about getting our attention. You know, if we stray off a little bit, God doesn't just go, oh, well, never mind. No, he's, he's passionately interested in us reaching our potential. That's what this series has been about, our vocation, our call. He's passionately interested in us being full of joy and peace and having this more and better life than we ever imagined. So if we wander off a bit, he is going to be a good father and let us know and get our attention again. And that's what this is about. And it links very strongly with the other passage, which I just can't get away from at the moment. It's, it's the one in two Chronicles where Solomon has just finished dedicating the temple. And can we have the next slide, please? Um, so he's finished dedicating the temple, which is like the actual place in those days where God's presence was. And he says to Solomon, when I stop the rain or send locusts to devour the land or send plagues. And I thought, wait a minute, not if, but when. Now, this is God saying to Solomon, preparing him, I am going to get your attention I'm, and if I need to get your attention, this is the sort of thing I might do. And uh, it's, I just find that a bit sobering because I'm not used to thinking of God like that. But it's not because he's nasty. It's because he wants us to have more and better life than we ever imagined. I hope you'll remember something from tonight. More and better life than we ever dreamed of. That's what's on his heart. So then the next 
slide or bit is God says, when I, and then he says, if my people, when I do this, if we humble ourselves, if we pray and seek his face, and if we turn from our wicked ways, there's a, there's a response. You know, when we've realized God's getting our attention, it's time to do this little MOT, this little health check, to humble ourselves, to pray and seek his face, and to turn from our wicked ways. You know, Jesus' main message was repent and believe the good news because the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent means think again, turn around, turn back to God. I'm doing it all the time. I'm finding those things I'm thinking, the directions I'm going in, that actually it's just me getting in charge again, or it's just not right. And so it's fine. We need to do this a lot. Repent, because God's kingdom is here. So a lot of people probably know the next bit, but this is God's promise. If we do the humbling ourselves, praying and seeking his face and turning from his ways, he is going to hear from heaven, he's going to forgive our sin, and he's going to heal our land. Now, I want God passionately. I want him to heal our land. All these culture things that I can go on about that really affect me and make me sad, I want him to heal our land. And he's promised. He's promised. He hasn't said, maybe I'll heal your land. Maybe there'll be a revival. Maybe things will change. He said, I will heal your land. Oh, it's good news. This is cultural change. This is collaborating with God and others for cultural change. Because I can't do it on my own. He says, if my people, not if my person, but if my people. And it's God's promise to us all. And, um, yeah, oh, right. So, thank you. Um, yeah, right. So the next point, uh, next slide then. The next thing that comes out of those letters in Revelation was this word, overcome. To him who overcomes, to those who conquer, to those who persevere. And this is something else. We've, it's part of the ticket. It's part of what it is to be a disciple. We do need to stand our ground. You know, remember there's this culture, steal, kill, and destroy. The enemy is so cross at us. Because we're getting in on God's happy life, wonderful life, freedom, joy, peace. We're getting healed up. And we're getting others into it too. And it makes the enemy really mad. He's like a prowling lion. Of course, you've got to remember he's a toothless lion now. Because Jesus has taken his dentures away. I love that picture. Sorry, sorry, I'm off on one there. But it's one of my pictures of, G of the devil being a prowling lion. But he opens his mouth and he's just all gums. Because Jesus has, has taken away his teeth, you know. It's probably a paraphrase of something in the Bible. Anyway, so the point is, yes, we are still in a battle. Things are contested. As we step out and move forward, it is contested. And the message that Jesus gave to all those churches was stand your ground. Stand your ground. And that's the message he's saying to us. We want to push through. We want to see things change. We will be contested. But we can stand our ground. And I put up there about the armor of God, because this, this, I just love this. You know, there's, there's this armor, right, that God has made for you and for me. It's not armor that you have to make. We don't go to blacksmith college and learn how to make swords and shoes and shields and belts. God has made them already. And this has been a revelation to me. Someone in the house of prayer that we're involved with told me about this, and it's just fantastic. So I just, I just want to say, Jesus says we need to conquer, we need to stand. And I think probably we should all be thinking about this every day and putting on the armor of God. This is Ephesians chapter 6. And, and the, the guy that wrote that, Paul, he, he said, finally, he said, after all the stuff he said in that wonderful book, he said, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Or another version says, be supernaturally transfused with strength, infused with strength. I just love that. I just think... I need to be infused with strength. I get tired. I get depressed. I get fed up. I look at all the problems too much. I need strength to keep going. And God has got it for me every single day. And um, so someone said, you know, imagine the armor that God's given you. Because I was saying, he's made it for you. It's not like, it's not like going to Poundland and getting the one pound belt of truth that's the same for everybody. It's not even like going to Ikea and getting, you know, a better, well, not Ikea, they don't do clothes, do they? See, I'm no good at clothes and culture. It's not like going to Marks and Spencer's and getting the best belt off the rack there that's still produced 
millions of around the world. No, there is a belt of truth that God has made for you, for you to put on, with the truth that he's equipping you with. And there's a breastplate of righteousness for you. And um, one day I was doing my prayers, and I just had this flash of light in front of me. And, and, and God just showed me my breastplate of righteousness is very shiny. And when the enemy comes towards me, and I've put my breastplate of righteousness on, he's dazzled by the brightness of my righteousness. Now, this isn't because I am a righteous person. This is because I've died to my way, and I'm living with Jesus, and his life is the life that's in me now. His righteousness is my righteousness, and it's bright and dazzling. And so I really needed to know that, and Jesus dropped that into my heart one day. So now, whenever I pray through the armor of God and I put on my breastplate of righteousness, I just have a little chuckle. It is bright and shiny, and, it, and, the, and the enemy can't look at it. Wow. And I just, I, I wasn't going to share that bit, but the other bit that I was going to share was about my shield of faith. Because one day I was praying about this, and I was just, 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 I just go through them. I don't do them every day. One of the messages for me in this talk is, Richard, put your armor on every day, because it's, it's so good for you. But I was doing this one day, I don't know, a few months ago, maybe a year ago now, and, and I just had this picture of my shield of faith. And you know what God says about it? It's the shield of faith that can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, the evil one does this, trying to send thoughts in to tell us we're no good, to tell us things are going to go wrong and all that sort of thing, flaming arrows. And God's given us a shield to extinguish them, put them out. And I had a little picture of my shield, and it was about three inches wide here on my arm. Not very big. And I said to God, that's not going to catch all the flaming arrows if I hold that up. And he said two things to me. He said, well, if I gave you a great big heavy shield, you wouldn't be able to lift it up, Richard. You need something smaller light, which hurt my pride a little bit. But that's fine, because actually also... He was saying to me, it's a supernatural shield. Duh. You know, it's not, it's not, you're not thinking like I'm thinking, he's saying. It's a shield of faith. And faith is small as a mustard seed anyway, isn't it? That's all we need. Faith is small as a mustard seed. And when I'm really tired and when I feel defeated, I know I don't need a huge amount of effort just to lift up my shield of faith. In fact, it's just like moving my arm a bit. And I lift it up. And I have found this shield of faith, for me, particularly helpful whenever I get tempted. Whenever I get a flaming arrow to look at a woman in a bad way, or you know, any kind of tempting that men often get tempted like that, I actually just think of my shield of faith, and I know that that's not me anymore. That's the culture of steal, kill, and destroy. I'm not in that anymore. I'm in the culture of more and better life than I ever imagined. And that thought is not me, it's just the enemy firing an arrow in. So I just lift up my shield of faith. I just say, you know, shield of faith, and I lift it up. And those thoughts go. And I love that. I love that. So I had to share that one. Shield of faith, right. So overcoming. We are equipped to overcome. And the third thing was to have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Next slide. Although I don't know why I'm... Yeah, it's a very short and simple slide. Sorry. But we need to keep an ear to the Holy Spirit to hear what he's saying to the churches. And I know it's obvious, but it's really, really important. Because if we're collaborating with God, we're doing the sort of things that he wants us to do. We're not just doing the things that we think is a good idea. We're not just copying what the church down the road are doing. We're not just copying what someone else in the church is doing. We're collaborating with God on the things he's got for us to collaborate on. And I, I'm going to give a quick example about street pastors. Because um, it brings a few things in. You know, street pastors. So they're these people from across the churches who go out at night or in the afternoon or when the kids come out of school, listening, caring, and helping. And they're a wonderful example of collaborating with God and others. It's totally God's idea that this, this group of people in blue coats are going to make any difference to our, our culture. But in Southampton, it started 10 years ago. And at that time, we were particularly helping young people who'd had too much to drink. And, and they were, had far too much to drink. They didn't even know who they were. They were just lolling around in the gutter. It was so undignified. And I had a real problem in my heart on this. Are we just 
making it possible for this behavior to go on? Are we just enabling it? Are we just condoning it? You know, should we just be standing there saying, it's really terrible, no, we shouldn't, should we? No, that wouldn't have really helped. And, and God spoke to me about it, and he just said to me something about dignity. We are treating people who've undignified themselves, or however you say it, we're treating them with dignity, we're giving them back their dignity. And, and it's an amazing thing, it's changing culture. And people who've been on the receiving end of that, they come up to us years later and say, oh, you helped me when I was in a really bad way, I don't drink like that anymore. Not everybody says that, of course, but some people have changed their personal culture because of that reaching out. And the culture has changed in the, in the city centre. Now, if you want to know more about this, talk to Jim Hazelden. He's not here tonight. He's been doing this for 10 years. He's, he is amazing. Faithfully, every month, going out and doing this work. It's amazing. And he can tell you how the violence has decreased, how our city centre used to be in the top 10 for violent streets in the nation, in England, and now it's not. Yes. Praise God. Yes. But, you know, I've got to say about conquer and standing our ground, because we still need to do it. We still need to do it, because at the moment we're finding there's a lot of real bad drug problems going on, and, and predatory males are on the increase. And I don't want to spread bad rumours or bad news, but it's true. We're, we're noticing a lot more of it. You know, our culture is still this steal, kill and destroy thing going on. And the street passers need to take their stand, they need to stand their ground, they need to keep going. Um, and I've got another more positive story, because we also do community patrols now in Millbrook, every Saturday now. We're out there sort of from 6 till 10, just in the places where people hang out, in the parks, around the shops. And uh, been really well placed actually with the Lucy McHugh murder. There was a lot of unrest in the community, and because the street passers were already embedded, they could just be out there and people could vent their anger and talk about things, and, and the street passers could help to calm things. And a couple of weeks ago, there was someone in the car park of the Saints pub, which the, the street passers don't go in for a swift half, but they do go and have a chat to everybody there. And he was actually waiting for them. He'd been waiting for I don't know how long, because he knew they were coming. His daughter was really ill, and he wanted the street passers to pray for him and his family. And so they did. And this guy started shaking with God's presence. And he said, I, I'm feeling all this electricity. And they told him, you know, that's God's Holy Spirit and he loves you. And so this is an open table. You know, the street pastor didn't ask him how much he drank that night. They didn't inquire about his moral standing at the moment. They just brought the presence of God to him right there on the street. So if I can mix my metaphors, you know, street pastors are bringing an open table on the streets where they go around. And... Um, We're, we're at an interesting place, street passers in Southampton. We could just like be ticking over, and you know, we could just keep ticking over. But we've been having some um, prayer retreats, the trustees and the staff together, for quite a regular time now. And God's been speaking to us, and this is the first time publicly I'm, I'm mentioning this. But he's, he's calling us fresh out to the neighborhoods in the city. He's calling us to bring his open table to engage with people where they are. And um, I'm kind of hoping that Flowers Estate will be top of the list for that. To have a, a regular sort of early evening patrol, to just go around and hang out wherever people are, to become this another way that God is reaching out and engaging with people, to become this open table so that people wait in Daisy Dip because they know the street passers are coming. I mean, you know, we hope that they'll come here, of course. <laughs> they'll know that they can find God here. But for people who aren't ready to come to church, it's, it's transforming. And particularly with the troubles we had back in June on the Flowers Estate, when there was an increase in sort of gang culture type going on, and there's some really quite serious things going on with knives. You know, that's the culture of steal, kill, and destroy. And that's the culture that God wants to transform with more and better life you know and I believe God is calling the street pastors out to interrupt the life of young people and and change their destiny by being there being part of his plan it's a collaboration with God and others and I think he's going to mobilize local churches across the city to, to have a new wave of volunteers to give up one 
one patrol a month and be out there and to pray at the same time. And I think it's, it's going to be part of God's transforming work in this city. And I'd like you to join with me in praying about this because we are fully stretched at Street Pastors. We've got a good staff, but we've got, I think it's 120 volunteers each week going out. Not each week, sorry, because they do once a month. But we've got a lot of volunteers, a lot of patrols, a lot of admin behind it all. And I don't think we could support a whole new other lot. So we've got to work out. We've got to collaborate with God. What are you saying? How is this going to be organized? Where are the volunteers coming from? And who's going to look after them? So I just, I just leave that with us. I'm sorry, I've been going on far too long. So, uh, well, there's one more thing, actually, about hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying. And it's, um, we had the South Coast Prophetic Conference here must be nearly a month ago now, which Joy so ably hosted. And um, I saw it on the notices, and I didn't really notice it on the notices, because it's on a Saturday, and I work on a farm on Saturdays, and by the evening I'm a bit hot and sweaty and tired, and I don't want to go out anywhere. And I thought it's all those prophetic people doing their thing, so, you know, I'm not in that group. I'll just let them get on with it. But God did a sneaky one on me, and I had a a text from um, my son during the week saying, Dad could you do PA on Saturday night for this conference? It turns out he was booked to do it, but actually he was being an usher at a wedding, not wishing to embarrass you, Sam, but you need a diary. <laughs> and um, so, so I was, and the thing that clinched it for me, I must also confess and be open with you, wasn't the thought of coming and serving and helping people have their conference. It wasn't the thought of hearing what the Holy Spirit is saying to the churches on the south coast of England, no. It was the fact that there was a little budget to pay the PA person. So when they said, we'll pay you, it's like, yep, yeah, I'm in. <laughs> so I just had to be honest there. But I came to this prophetic thing, and I, I was really glad I did really glad, particularly because there was a guy here called Chris Wickland from a church in Fareham, and I'd, I'd heard some of his prophecies on YouTube, which um, I'd heard, and I was a little nervous about them, because they're the kind of prophecies that aren't just like general and vague, you know, God's going to bless you and good things are going to happen. He was being a bit specific about things going to happen in this country, about Brexit, about politics, And I generally steer away from that because I know not everybody's cup of tea to hear such specific things about what God's going to be doing and how do we know it's true and things. And and so basically I had this kind of, I'm not going to listen to that. Um, And particularly in my work with the House of Prayer, I'm not going to major on it. You know, if, if some people are listening to this, that's fine. But, you know, God really did want me to know this. Um, Because we'd need to have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And, and in the end, it's nothing really terrible or controversial, but it's just like in the Old Testament. When, when God said to Solomon that he would be getting the attention of people from time to time, um, God's been speaking that he is going to get our attention as a nation again. And it's not specific about how it's going to pan out and what it's going to look like, but there's going to be something going wrong with politics. And at the moment, it's not really difficult to guess that that's going to happen, is it, to be honest? But it's like a warning, and it's also God saying he's going to do something, not because he's nasty, but because he wants us to have more and better life than we ever dreamed of. And at the moment, the culture of our nation is, is not like that. It's steal, kill, and destroy. And um, so I'm just passing this on, that basically, if we have any sudden difficult, uncomfortable things happening in this country, be encouraged, because God wants us as a whole nation to return to him. And this prophecy that Chris has had is about like a national phenomena, not just a revival in one place, not just, you know, in a few churches in some city where people just can't help but come in because they feel constrained to find God. It's going to be a national phenomenon. That's what this guy is saying. And that's why there's going to be some difficulty on the way, because God needs to wake the nation up again. So I'm just passing that on so we're ready. So we're not suddenly afraid. But we we can watch the news, we can see what's happening without getting scared. We know our God. We know his heart. And we know he's going to look after us, and we know what he's up to, to an extent. So I think that's about all, really. 
last week, Jim spoke about Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb and being ready to go into the promised land. And if you didn't hear that one, have a listen to that. There's also notes so you can read it if you prefer reading to listening. And Jim, at the end of his talk, he was saying he believes God is on the move here in Southampton. And I believe that very much too. And he said, um, he said, how do we prepare for this move? And he particularly said, look, see, there was a time when Joshua and Caleb were ready to go into the land, but that wasn't when God took them in. He waited until everyone was ready. You know, there was another chance. There was a more time of preparing. And so I'm just thinking about this. Are we ready? How is God getting us ready? And I haven't really got an answer for that. But I, I know that we are a people of presence, not just individuals of presence. We're a people of God's presence. And we're city life, and we're part also of the body of Christ in Southampton. We need to have a city-wide focus of who we are. You know, Jesus is writing a letter to the church in Southampton. Um, and I've got, so I've got three, four things to suggest as we're just going on to our summer break. Yes, the disciples' daily prayer is one of them. And so this is a prayer I found so helpful. Jesus, I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you hear. I want to think what you think. And I've been praying that for a while, and it is a very transforming prayer. Not very complicated. Even someone like me can pick it up. I want to see what you see. I want to hear what you hear. I want to think what you think. That is transforming. And that's what we need to be. That's how we need to look and be in the world. The armor of God, I've already said about that. I commend that to you. Try it over the summer, every day. Just read it through. See what God says to you about each of the bits of the armor of God and be supernaturally infused with strength. And then think about where is God getting our attention? You know, you may, this may transform how you see some of the things going on in your life um, and in the life of the church together. Is there some way that God is getting our attention as a church and as individuals? And then press in. You know, because that was all about if my people, uh, we get to that heal, healing the land bit and I get really excited. And then it's the same kind of question, what is the Holy Spirit saying to the churches? Because that wasn't, that, I don't think Jesus said that to the church leaders. It was a letter to the church, the whole church. It was a letter to, in fact, to anyone with ears. Let them hear what the Spirit is saying. So I just commend that to us. I'm excited for what we're going to start hearing over the summer. I'm excited for how God's going to transform the situations that are difficulties that actually he's getting our attention. I'm excited that as we put on the armor of God, we're going to stand our ground. And on that one, actually, just ask God, what ground am I to stand on? What ground am I holding on? Where, you know, what is it that the enemy's trying to knock me off and that you're just going to keep me here? Um, and then the next slide. If my people humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. And I'm just going to pray for us on this. Oh, Father, I just feel like you've made it so easy for us. You do all the hard stuff. And I, I just ask you, Holy Spirit, to particularly take this word and um, fulfill it among us. That we can humble ourselves, we can pray and seek your face. And we can turn from our wicked ways in the sure knowledge of your promise that you will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. And we're going to keep going, God, I think. I think we're going to keep going because we want you to heal our land. And I pray that this promise will take root among us as a people. I expect we've all heard it before, but I pray for the fresh word of God 
Holy Spirit, anoint this word in our hearts. I really want you to write this in our hearts, Holy Spirit, that we become a people reverberating with this promise that you are going to heal our land. And we might not understand how, we might not see everything, but what we see is you are going to hear from heaven, you're going to forgive our sin, and you're going to heal our land. And I ask you, over this summer, please, Lord, take us on. Thank you for all the wonderful teaching we've had in this term. And I pray it will, it will be like seed that hits good soil and produces a crop a hundredfold, two hundredfold, three hundredfold. Let your word come to fruition in our hearts, Father. You've done so well. You've given us so much this term in all that we've heard. Now come, Lord. Make it grow. Make it germinate in our hearts. Let the promises that you're giving us become our culture, become our language, become our heartbeat. Amen.